Good afternoon and um, happy Mother's Day. Thank you all for coming out and spending your Mother's Day afternoon with us. Um, my name is Randall Brandt and I'm a librarian at UC Berkeley and um, I have the, the distinct honor of moderating this, um, this panel today, Nordic Noir. So before we get started, I first want to thank the sponsors of this, uh, this session, the Barbara Osher Pro Suecia Foundation, Norway House Foundation, Norla, Norwegian Literature Abroad, and the Consulate General of Sweden in San Francisco. So immediately after the panel, there will be um, an opportunity for you to purchase books by the panelists and to get them signed and to meet with, with them and have a chat. Um, that will be at the, um, the Sausalito Books by the Bay tent, which is basically just directly across the park from where we are here uh, over on Alston. And also, if you have not done so already, please take this opportunity to silence your phones or any other noise-making devices you might have with you. OK, so I'm going to introduce the panel. So first of all, we have today here Camilla Sten, uh, who is joining us from Sweden, but by way of Barcelona, which I found out just recently. Um, she has been writing stories since she was a young girl and is famously one of the most important sounding boards for her crime writing mother, Vivica Sten. In 2019, she stepped out into the spotlight herself and published the internationally acclaimed hair-raising novel, The Lost Village. Among other recognition, The Lost Village was selected as one of the best books of 2021 by NPR. Her second novel, The Resting Place, was just published in March this year and is picking up more positive reviews every day. Kirkus called it deep laid, tightly wound, and very, very cold. And publishers weekly declare that Sten is on a roll. Next we have Thomas Enger, who's here from Oslo, Norway. Formerly a journalist, uh, Thomas has now turned to the much more sensible career of crime fiction author. His first novel, Burned, was published in the US in 2011 and is the first in a series um, featuring journalist Henning Yule. The uh, British critic and Nordic noir expert Barry Forshaw noted that Thomas Enger has gained a reputation as one of the most unusual and intense talents in the field with a notably trenchant eye for human misanthropy. Thomas is the co-author with a fellow Norwegian crime writer, Jorn Lear Horst, of a series featuring Oslo police investigator Alexander Blix and news blogger Emma Ram. The third book in the series has just been published and it is called Unhinged. Also joining us from Sweden is Karen Gerhardsen. Karen worked as a mathematician and an IT consultant before she became a full-time writer. The first three books of her Hammerby series, which circle around Detective Inspector Kone Schoberg and his team solving gruesome murders in the southern areas of Stockholm, appeared in English translations back in 2012. Her most recent book is the standalone novel called Black Ice, which was named one of the top 10 mysteries of 2021 by Publishers Weekly. So please help me welcome our guest this day. Okay, so my first question uh, is I want, I want them to each tell us a little bit more about their, their books. And so Karen, um, so in that Publishers Weekly review that I just mentioned, um, Black Ice is called a complex psychological thriller of flawed people who make bad choices. They also said that it was plotted with mathematical precision, which is what you would expect from a writer who is a mathematician, right? So, um, so Karen, if you could just tell us a little bit more about what Black Ice is about. I'm sorry, I can't, because it's too complex and I will give away too much. Well, we don't want to have any spoilers <laughs> here today. Am yeah. I done here now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just go buy the book and read it. Well, it's a complex story, so it's really hard to talk about it because the reader is not supposed to know and understand things more, one piece at a time. So it takes some time to, to really understand what's going on here. 
but it takes place um, in two time frames, four years apart, in uh, the Swedish island of Gotland during winter. Um, it's black ice on the roads. I wrote the story from the perspectives of four different characters and how their lives and circumstances intersect in a very dramatic way. Um, the conditions of a, of a icy, deserted back road brings together four strangers and um, that encounter will change their lives forever. Um, I don't know what to say really because it's really hard to describe this book, but, but it, it's a very severe car accident going on and that's the, um, what happens in the beginning. And then you follow four different characters and their thoughts and their doings and what happens to their lives, uh, which is really bad things because of what happened four years ago. But why is the question? And that you will find out eventually. By reading the book. <laughs> when I read it, I, I kept thinking that it was, it was like peeling an onion. And every time you, you thought you knew what was going on, you peeled off another layer and everything changed. So. Thank you. I should, I should have uh, memorized that way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. So you can use that in the next time. Yeah, I do. Okay. Okay. I steal it from you. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> Okay, um, Camilla, can you tell us a little bit more about The Resting Place? Uh, yes. Let's see. So The Resting Place is uh, a book about a woman, Eleanor, who suffers from prosopagnosia, or clinical face blindness. Uh, she's been raised by her uh, narcissistic, quite cruel grandmother, Vivian, and one night when she arrives at Vivian's apartment for a Sunday dinner, she finds Vivian dead on the hallway floor having been stabbed to death with a pair of silver scissors, and she sees the murderer leaving the apartment. But because of her condition, she can't actually identify the murderer to the police, and she doesn't know if it might be someone she knows, a complete stranger, or something in between. And the majority of the book takes place about five months after the murder, when, uh, during the reading of the will, they find out that Vivian had a mansion that Eleanor had never heard, never heard about that's been abandoned for about 40 years. No one's been there since Eleanor's grandfather died. And so, in order for the inheritance to be handed out, they have to go out there and set a price point on it, or otherwise they can't do a fair, fair handling of the inheritance. So Eleanor, her boyfriend, their lawyer, and her aunt go out to Sulhaga, which is the mansion, and once out there, they start discovering secrets about Vivian that no one knew and suspecting that they might not be completely alone out there on the countryside. That was my slightly too yeah. long elevator pitch. No, that's it was a long elevator ride. We were in there for a long time. <laughs> I'm going to steal all of that yes. when I'm between my, my book. Well, yeah, we wrote identical books, actually. It's a yeah. little weird. Yeah. It's like the elevator at the hotel is 12 floors. So. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Thomas, um, so you've been writing this uh, series the Alexander Blix and El Emma Ram series. Um, there are three books in the series. The first one is Death Deserved, the second one is Smokescreen, and then the third one, which I mentioned, is Unhinged. Um, could you just tell us a little bit more about sort of the, the series as a whole, um, not, not each plot of each book, but just okay. sort of the, uh, how those, those char characters come together? Yeah, well, um, first of all, I'm writing this with another uh, colleague of mine, Jörn Lierhorst. Um, his background, he used to be a police officer. I used to be a journalist. So when we decided to write something, to, um, something together, we figured out that our main, two main protagonists should be a police officer and, and a journalist. Um, very original. Um, and yes, so um, Alexander Blix is the cop. Emma Ram is the news blogger sidekick. Um, and their, um, uh, their lives are are very much uh, in, in, intertwined, to put it that uh, They're not in relation with each other, but um, they, um, uh, they are very much, um, how do I put it? Um, their fates are very much uh, connected, um, because when Emma Ram was only five years old, Alexander Blix shot and killed her father in a hostage sit, uh, situation. He had, um, um, Emma's dad had first killed Emma's mother and was about to kill Emma as well when Alexander Blix in, in, interrupted the, um, 
hostage, hostage situation and saved her. Um, after that, he kind of kept tabs on her life, kind of. Um, obviously, she was an orphan, uh, and it was his fault. And that kind of, um, well, that incident was, was very, um, uh, very hard for him. Um, it, it changed the course of his career, um, basically. And uh, 19, 20 years later, she has turned into a journalist. And when she, um, um, when she starts to work on a case, um, their paths kind of in, in, intersect again. Um, um, so um, obviously he, he has been uh, following her career, um, her life, but, but all of a sudden he, uh, and she doesn't know about his role in her dad's um, um, death. So, so that, is, that is a bit tricky to begin with in, in, in book one for the both of them. But as the series progress, they, they, uh, they get closer and closer, and, ob and, and, and obviously the truth about what happened during that hostage, hostage situation um, is, is known to Emma quite, quite quickly. So um, that is the, the, the setup of those two characters and, and, and how, they, um, um, yeah, how their lives are, are, are and, and fates are connected. Um, so yes. Yeah, so one of the things when I've, when I've been reading the books I've, that I've been struck with is that Alexander and Emma seem to have a sort of a father-daughter relationship, yeah. even, even though he's not her father. Yes. Um, and, and Alexander Blix does have a daughter. Yeah. Um, so maybe tell us a little bit more about, about the relationships of those, those three. Yeah, I've, well, I think you put it uh, really nicely. With, with, uh, um, he has felt a certain responsibility for her throughout her life. Obviously, him, he, um, he was responsible for her father's death. So, so he, uh, he feels that he slightly owes her a little bit. So when, then, when, when she starts to work as a journalist on a case that he, he is working on as a lead, lead police um, investigator, uh, he feels that he can, he can slip her a, f a, f a few pieces of information here and there to help her. This is when, when she's, she's, she has just started working as a crime, crime reporter. Um, so, so, yeah, and, and um, he, he doesn't have a very good relationship with his daughter when the series begins. And, 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 and that has, has mainly because he's been so preoccupied with his work. Uh, he, uh, he struggled deeply uh, with that incident when he killed Emma's um, father. Uh, dived into work. The marriage ended because of that. He never really took took good care of his daughter, which sh uh, she resents him for. So, um, in a way, Emma becomes more kind of like the daughter he he never really had, or never really um, um, how, how do I put it? Yes, I, I'm sure you can get a um, get a broader. Um, a broad picture of, of how difficult this is for all of them. Um, but slowly but surely, um, Iseline is, is, is Alexander's daughter's name. Uh, she gets more into his life as well, which definitely is the case in the third book, Unhinged, um, where she becomes a witness to, um, to a murder. Um, and very much in the, in the uh, uh, um, how do you say? Um, the killer, obviously, since since she is a witness, she she um, she's in very much um, danger. So, yeah, I don't know yeah. if I managed yeah. to yeah. Uh, no, that's great. Explain this very well, but anyway. <laughs> um, so all three of you have written stories um, around characters who have vulnerabilities. Um, sometimes those are physical characteristics that make them vulnerable, or, or perhaps psychological, or they've experienced um, past traumas. So um, Camilla, you, you mentioned about Eleanor, your character, and that she suffers from prosopagnosia, which is a real thing, right? Um, and, and you write a lot about how it affects her um, psychologically. So if you, could you tell us a little bit more about you know, how you chose that as a, as a characteristic and how you work it into the uh, describing her? Well, um, I get all my book ideas from writing uh, strange articles at four in the morning, uh, which uh, everyone who knows me know. So uh, my family and my friends and my partner all gather up articles about strange illnesses or events and send them to me so I have something to do for my research. 
And I think I encountered the concept of prosopagnosia about five or six years ago. And uh, uh, it wasn't an immediate part of the story as I was starting to plot it out. Uh, I, I really wanted to write something about identity, how you perceive the self, um, and how trauma can travel through generations. Uh, something happens to your grandmother, your great-grandmother, her mother, and it affects you today. And uh, the prose of Pagnosia actually came in when it suddenly occurred to me that that would be a really interesting way of, of framing that sense of a loss of identity through literally being unable to recognize yourself in the mirror and recognizing others around you. How do you form a sense of self when you can when you have to rely on manually memorizing the things that come instinctively to others. Um, and so that's, that's really how I started building the character of Eleanor. I, I, I built her as this person who has grown up um, with a very, very demanding, um, very inconsistent parental figure um, who took up a lot of space. She is, uh, I wrote the book after my grandmother passed, actually as a way of dealing with my feelings from my grandmother, who was a very beautiful, very difficult, very driven, very funny woman, uh, all in equal measure. Uh, I got my love of color from her. She was very colorful, literally. <laughs> um, and I wanted to grapple with the feelings I had around her and what I felt after her passing. She did not get violently murdered. She died from natural causes. But, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> it always feels violent when someone is taken from you, no matter if it's their time or not. Uh, and I, I had a rough time with that after she passed, this idea that I loved her, but I was angry with her still. There were so many things that we were never going to get to work out. There were so many apologies I'd been waiting for on some level that I was now never going to get. So I had to reconcile that on my own. Um, all these facets of this person and how they could all be true at the same time. And uh, that's how Vivian grew out. And then Vivian and Eleanor are really are really the two hearts of the story, the grandmother and the granddaughter, and how they've affected each other, how these wounds have traveled through generations, and how you can maybe possibly heal them a little bit by accepting what happened. Uh, also, I, I feel forced to mention that prose of is a phenomenal thing for a thriller. I, I, I'm genuinely upset I can't put it in every thriller from now on. It is so <laughs> practical. Oh my God! I really, I almost feel like I spent it too early. You know, I should have, I should have sat on that a little while longer. But yeah, it's, it's amazing that you're the first person to come up with it. Oh, I'm not. Oh, you're not. No, okay. no. Alice Sweeney, I think is her name, mm. released Rock Paper Scissors okay. uh, just a few months before Resting Place came out. I was so upset too because yeah. I was first in Swedish, but she was first in English. <laughs> I'm still upset about that. <laughs> Seen so many reviews for they're like, oh, it seems like everyone's doing it now. And Alice's like, you know what? I did it first. Damn it! It's a great <laughs> book though. You should really read Rock Paper Scissors. It's, it's a phenomenal book. Well, you know, the character of Vivian, even though she, she's murdered, like, you know, on page one, mm -hmm. um, you know, she's in Eleanor's head, and, and she gets a lot of lines in the book, too, because of Eleanor's, um, you know, constant memories of her, so. Yeah, I wanted to play with the concept of a haunting. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's this phenomenal line that I can't remember, where it's, I think it's from Russian Doll, the Netflix series, where they say, Built places are not haunted, people are haunted. Uh, and I wanted to play with that concept in the book. There are no actual ghosts in the story, I'm sorry to say, but everyone, the, the, the house is very haunted by the things that have happened there. You know, you can, in, the, in the way that you can sometimes feel something still lingering in the walls. Uh, I do think that sometimes when, when a house has a violent history, you can feel that there's something a little bit off about it. And Eleanor is very haunted. Uh, and Vivian was a phenomenally fun character to write. <laughs> she has a very specific voice. Uh, she tried to push her way into a lot of contexts where I actually didn't want or need her voice, so I had to go through and edit out Vivian where she didn't belong in the text. Um, I, I still have the feeling that she's mad at me for that. I know she's a fictional character, but I can't shake the feeling <laughs> that this person I made up is very upset with me for taking away her space. She wants more limelight. Well, maybe you can write it. Write another book about it. Do a prequel. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't tempt me. Oh, don't tempt me. I have contracts to fulfill. I might ju do one just for myself. <laughs> so, um, Karen, no spoilers, I know. Um, 
But so, so you mentioned you, it, the story is told from the perspective of four characters, um, but three of them are female characters, and each one of those female characters has has suffered some sort of trauma or tragedy in their life, um, sometimes related to each other. But so, could you just tell us a little bit more about about those three characters and what you did with them? Yeah, one one of them, Janet, she has. Um, she has lost a child, and um, she and her husband are really suffering from that still four years later. And there was another thing that happened four years ago, too, that she's still suffering from. What that was exactly? Well, we don't know yet. But she's suffering as hard as so she's been, you know, we call it in Swedish the A-team. I'm sure you don't use that term, terminology, but the A-team is the team sitting on the bench boozing, drinking booze all the day and, and um, not doing anything for a living. They just uh, living on social welfare and drinking and have, having fun together. They are not exactly homeless, but, they, well, they could be but they, um, they are drinking, they're spending their days drinking, so that's what she's doing with her soulmates right now. You wanna tell us anything about Sandra or Kirsten? Sandra, <laughs> Sandra is, um, what is she? Well, she's a mother uh, of a young boy, and she's, um, uh, I can't tell you any more than that. <laughs> <laughs> what about Kirk? What I, I, about can't, I can't. Okay, okay. She's, a, she's a nice nice kind of person. She's a nice, yeah. yeah, well, yeah. Uh, that's all I have to say about her. Okay, what about Kirsten? What is her job? Well, we'll see. What is it? What does she do? Why, why doesn't she have any friends? Well, we don't know yet. We'll find out eventually. And the third one, um, is a widow. <laughs> it's really, really <laughs> difficult to, to describe these people. You just learn to know them piece by piece, a little bit at a time, um, because you, you, you're you listening to their thoughts. And uh, at some point, a few of them get together coincidence, by co coincident, and um, well, things happen because of that, yes. yeah, it's really hard. It's the same with all the books I've written, except one. I've written a, a series of eight crime novels, and I have one of them, number two, that I actually can talk about in front of an audience. All the others are so complex okay. and secretive, you don't even know the theme of the book until you get to the end, because I have, they are... I have, I have a question later about book number one. So yeah, all right, okay, yeah. Well, we'll see. So <laughs> Um, so Thomas, um, Emma, um, also in, in addition to being an orphan, um, she suffers from alopecia, which has caused her to lose her hair. And thanks to Will Smith and Chris Rock, we all in America know Everyone a lot more about, about apicia, alopecia than we did before. Um, so how does this character's trait influence the way Emma thinks and acts? Um. Not to a great uh, extent, I would say. Um, it's, it's something that she's learned to, to cope with. She, she's not open about it. She wears wigs all the time. Um, there's only a handful, well, not even a handful of people who know about it. Um, and she goes about doing everything else as, as, a, as normally as she, she possibly can. She, she exercises, she goes to work, she has uh, lovers, she, she um, but even the lovers, don't really know about this side of her. It's, it's not something that she's um, vocal about. Um, what happens during uh, the course of these books is that she has a niece uh, who um, also suffers from the, she has, um, um, there are early signs that she's suffering from the, the same thing. So that is something that we, uh, we will talk more about as, as the series um, progresses. Um, So, Camilla, in, um, in The Lost Village, your first book, you included a foreword where you tell the reader right up front that there are three female characters in the book who suffer from various degrees of mental illness. 
Um, so why did you think it was important to sort of alert the reader to this right up front before they even started reading the book? Um, <clears throat> I want to note that forward was one of the most stressful things I've ever done because it was the first time I'd written directly in English as opposed to getting it translated. So I forced my, my poor boyfriend to read it 16 times to check <laughs> the grammar um, before it went out. I, I studied psychology for three years at a university level. Uh, I was actually two, I was on the track to becoming a professional licensed psychologist before I suddenly dropped out to write books instead. Also a very stable career decision. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I've, uh, I've been to therapy for years myself. Uh, I personally think that during the pandemic I paid for my therapist's second summer home. Um, <laughs> And I, mental illness makes its way into a lot of my books as a theme just because I have struggled with depression and anxiety myself. Um, I have slowly but surely discovered that most of my friends have struggled with depression, anxiety, or some other shade of mental illness at some point in their lives, but we didn't talk about it until it started coming up by necessity. And I think every book really is a reflection of its writer. You can usually discover things about the writer by reading the book. Not always necessarily what they were intending to put in the book. Uh, and uh, The Lost Village is very much a reflection of things I enjoy and things I think about a lot. It is in the style of a found footage horror movie, which is the only genre of movies I would watch between the ages of 13 and 17, so that's where that comes from. I'm very into cult podcasts and books, and that's where the occult element in the book comes from. And uh, I think mental health is something that we talk too little about, especially and how common it is and how it actually works. And we like to demonize, especially women with mental health, uh, I think there's a lot of nuances around mental health and gender, and if we start getting into that, then this is no longer going to be a Nordic Noir panel. This is going to be Camilla's <laughs> TED Talk on mental health and stigma, uh, <laughs> which I think would be enjoyable, but that is not what you're here to listen to. But yeah, I felt like it was some, just to circle back to your actual question and not my <laughs> tangent. Uh, I, I thought it was important to put that forward in there because I was concerned that people suffering from mental health issues might feel singled out by the way that some of the characters in the book describe mental health issues. In the book, there are people who are prejudiced against uh, people suffering from depression or psychosis uh, or who are on the spectrum, and they make certain inflammatory statements, and a big part of the point of the book is to refute those and show what happens when you let that sort of prejudice cloud your view. But I was concerned. I wanted to put it there not quite as a trigger warning, but just as a heads up to people that this is going to be about mental health. The intentionality of the book is to showcase the humanity of people with mental health and show it's a struggle, but it's just one facet of a larger picture. And, uh, you know, I think it's, I know I appreciate it when people put that in. Yeah. And that's well, what we're going to tie together. Well, it was interesting because I, I actually read The Lost Village before I got a copy of, of The Resting mm -hmm. Place. And so that was the first thing I'd ever read of yours was yeah. that forward. And I was just kind of like, wow. This is going to be a really like honest book, right? And 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 it was, and I kind of forgot about it as I read the book. And then it was kind of like, wait a minute, there's supposed to be characters with mental health issues here. And you know, it was it was I think it was woven into the story so seamlessly that you know it didn't you know it didn't, wasn't like big. Oh, here's a mental health issue, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I didn't so, want to make it a very special episode yeah, type thing. Yeah. You know, it's just just people living with. Yeah with yeah. problems, and yeah. also getting murdered, um, yeah. but those are not related. <laughs> <laughs> right. So <laughs> anyway, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was a unique reading experience for me to read that oh, and then to start. So anyway, that was a good job. Um, so Karen, so your first crime novel, uh, which in English is called The Gingerbread House. Um, so in that book, the killer's motivation is rooted in traumas experienced as a result of childhood bullying. Um, what made you want to explore, explore bullying as a motivation for crime? Well, I think I'm not the first one who's done that, but that was built on my own experiences as a child. So, um, to be honest, the whole book is based on my own experiences. All violence, or torture scenes, all that is my own, are my own experiences, except for the murders, which is just, um, could have been one expression for 
uh, the, the memories of your childhood and the experiences that you have made, but not mine, of course. But, um, well, people react differently to, to what they go through, and I guess um, this violence that I describe in that novel is one possible way of um, reacting to such a childhood. So writing crime fiction as self-therapy. Yeah, well, not really self-therapy, yeah. but that's, <laughs> that was something I knew of. So yeah. when I, I, when I um, decided to write a series of crime novels, I just, um, well, you dig where you stand, as we're saying. Uh, to just take some of your own experiences and, and make something of it. So that's what I did that. Then there is nothing that I have experienced myself in the rest of my books. But the first one, you know, that was the simplest way of just kicking, kicking off that crime writing career. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Thomas, in, in your first series, the protagonist is a reporter, Henning Ewell. Um, and he has, he has severe burn scars and he has been traumatized by the death of his son. Um, so, you know, in, in a way, he's, he's scarred both physically and emotionally. So, um, you know, tell us a little bit more about, about him and, and that series and how you work through uh, sort of his, oh. his background. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I, I um, wanted to become an author since I was about 20. Uh, during, during the course of about 15 years, I tried four times, didn't make it, as a, didn't get published. Um, and uh, at at some point, I figured out that I was I was doing lots of things wrong. I was I was writing about people that that I didn't know about. My first attempt was about a a woman who was living in New York. She was about mid forties, and obviously I was twenty one, twenty, <laughs> come, coming come, coming from Norway. I had never even visited New York, <laughs> so it was it was um, uh, it it kind of dawned upon me that I should try to write something about stuff that I knew about. So I decided to make my main character um, a journalist, which I had been myself for, um, uh, for a good while at that time. Um, and, and I, and I thought, thought about what is the worst thing that can happen to me? And that is, obviously, I have, I have kids, as, as a lot of people do. And, and for something terrible to happen to my own child, that was, that was my worst nightmare. So I kind of utilized that in 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 my my um in my story um and uh um it was it was um i wouldn't necessarily call, say cathartic but but when you write about the loss of of something you have to try to imagine what that's like and of course i had i, I had small children at the time i was writing writing that series of uh, of uh, five books so i had to put myself in in henning in henning Yule's shoes every single day, uh, imagining how it would be like to be him without, I mean, literally my own kids. And, and um, um, that was very, very hard, extremely difficult um, to do. Um, but, um, but at the same time, I couldn't have written that, that series without having become a father. And I think writing about his trauma as well, um, I, I think it made maybe made me a better father as well, um, because I, I'm, I was um, um, I learned what well, learned. Uh, I became more appreciative appreciative um, mm -hmm. about the fact that I still have kids that are alive and, and that I can still do fun things with them. So so, but anyway, Henning Yule is a very very smart journalist and 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 um, the whole premise of that series is that he's going to uh, try to figure out who was responsible for the fire who um, basically who who um, who killed his son so he is um, after, uh, two years after that fire he decides to go back to work as a journalist he works some some different cases while he is um, uh, he's constantly on that quest trying trying to figure out what really happened there because as a journalist, of course, he had pissed a few people off during his um, his career as a um, as a crime crime investigative journalist. So um, um, yeah, it was a, it was a bold thing to do. I, I I wanted to 
to write a series where every single book was c kind of connected to each other, almost like a TV series. Every, every book was an episode in that TV series. Um, and uh, now, I'm, now I'm just waiting for Netflix to actually make it into a TV series. <laughs> that, would, that would be nice. That but, would be great. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> so um, I want to have a little conversation here about setting. So. Um, Camilla's two novels, The Lost Village and The Resting Place, are both set in remote and isolated locations um, that are far in the wilderness. Uh, Thomas's novels are set primarily around the urban center of Oslo. And Karen, in Black Ice, you set it on an island um, off the coast of Sweden called Gotland. So do you, can, this is a question for all three of you, um, whoever wants to answer first, jump in. So do you consider setting to be a crucial element of the narrative, and how do you decide where you want to set a story? Well, I set Black Ice uh, on the island of Gotland because I needed a place that was a limited, limited place, which, from which it wasn't that easy to run away or disappear. Uh, a place where you are not likely to meet somebody you meet within the next four years, but it's not impossible to meet that person again after four years. So I needed that amount of people living there, and Gotland is an island of 57,000 people. So I thought that's not unre unrealistic to run into each other after four years and to not have done it before. So that's why I, why I picked uh, an island like that. Um, well, I, I picked both, uh, um, so both The Lost Village and The Resting Place are set at fictional locations, uh, and that is because I am bad at geography, and I can't read maps. Uh, but the reason that I designed, that was not a joke by the way, I really can't read maps, I'm, I have no sense of direction whatsoever, and every time I've tried to set a book in a real location, I've gotten absolutely hammered with emails and messages from people saying, that street does not connect to that other street, and I go, yep. That's on me, man. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but I, I, I think I picked isolated locations for similar reasons as you got in. Um, it, it's easier to work, I find, with a confined space, especially if you're going to set the story over a short amount of time and with a limited number of characters. Uh, I like to work with classic, uh, writing thrillers that utilize classic horror tropes. Um, the Lost Village imitates the found footage movie, and The Resting Place is actually my take on a gothic horror novel. And so when you're working with a limited amount of characters, it's easier to set them in an isolated area, because then you can just work with the interpersonal dynamics of it all. And I don't have to look at any maps. I cannot express enough what a big perk that is for me. <laughs> for me, it's, it's, um, it, it started out as something of, uh, um, of convenience. I was living in Oslo and as I mentioned earlier I, 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 I wanted to write about something that I knew so I, I made my main, main character walk the streets that, that I was basically walking every single day to make it as, as authentic as, as, as humanly possible. But of course where you set, set a story is, is, is well it's, it, it, it's, it's very important. Um, a place can be a character um, and, and uh, as I mean, as any character in any book, that that has a huge importance. Um, I've, I've I've written books which aren't necessarily set in a big city. I come from a pretty small place myself. I wrote um, a novel which was kind of uh, I didn't call it the same name as the city that I was coming from. Everyone knew that knew anyway <laughs> that it was this uh, that that place that I was talking about, but. But um, I made that choice very consciously because I wanted to talk about how, uh, how rumors spread very quickly in small places and, 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 and how, that, how um, uh, one feather can turn into five chickens or, or whatever the, <laughs> the phrase is. Um, and I have a lot of experience with that, knowing, um, I mean, I knew what it was like to, to grow up in a place like that. Um, so. I wanted to to um, uh, to address that, um, but yeah, um, my the majority of the books that I've written are set in Oslo. It's it, it's where I live. I know Oslo, I, and it's a very international city as well. I mean, we have more nationalities um, in 
living in living in in Oslo than there are members in the um, um, in the United Nations. So there is a lot to to uh, to turn into fiction. Um, I mean, a lot of issues to um, uh, to tackle in um, in the world of crime fiction. So yeah, I. Uh, I, I, I tend to uh, in, enjoy a lot writing about places that I know because it's easier. I'm, 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 I'm a bit lazy on that front. So, yeah. I picked uh, Stockholm as a scene for my other books, my series that starts with the Gingerbread House, the Hammerby series. But that was because, yeah, well, I know Stockholm, obviously, because I, I, I'm living there. But also, Stockholm, or the southern parts of Stockholm, in fact, have, has all that I need. I need. Um, a big city, I need poor areas, I'm, I need wealthy areas where people are living in ditch, detached houses, I need forest, I need sea, I need lakes. It's got everything that I need and might be needing for coming stories. So that's also a thing that you have to prepare so you yeah. could actually set a story there, whatever that story is. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah, you know, I, the book I'm working on right now is set in, in the area of Stockholm where I grew up. Uh, and uh, I was thinking, you know, this time, this time I'm going to do it, man. I lived there for 22 years. <laughs> I'm going to represent this accurately. I'm going to do it. I'm going to cross-check everything. I sent the script to my mom. She texted me the next day. She said, Camilla, really? <laughs> 22 years you've lived there. <laughs> and you didn't get a single street name right. <laughs> Mm. I said, well, did you like it? And she said, that's not the point, Camilla. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I think she liked it, though. I think, I think she enjoyed it. Well, you, you can correct street names. I mean, that's why you have an editor. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I will say, confess that the reason, I, I, I think that you all have a very strong sense of place in your books, and, um, and, and I like books that, that, that do that. Um, and I actually have beside my bed where I usually read at night, I have a stack of guidebooks from various Scandinavian countries <laughs> so, that, <laughs> so that when I'm reading and it mentions something, you know, if it's, if it's Oslo or, or Stockholm, I, I, I kind of know them in my mind, but then as soon as they go to like Bergen or something, I'd have to go get up my map and find out, well, where is that? How far, did that, how far is that? How long did it take them? So, you are my nightmare reader. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. I'm not checking street names. You can, you, can, you can give me any street name you want, I won't notice. Um, but if you, if you put the city, if you say they went north, and no. actually they should have gone south, I might catch you on that. So. <laughs> if, yeah. I've never been to Scandinavia, so you can get, I can, you can get away with a lot with me. So it's all guided. We'll give anyway. you a guided tour when you come. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> yes, and then it'll, then it'll be even better to read the books. Um, so, Scandinavian crime fiction is often described in cold weather terms, um, at least in marketing it to English audiences. So I, I quoted Barry Forshaw earlier, and that was from a book called Death in a Cold Climate, um, his survey of Scandinavian crime fiction. Um, so, you know, when you're writing, how, what do you, how do you use weather conditions to drive the narrative or affect the stories? You're asking the author of Black Ice? Yes, <laughs> and title your book Black Ice. Which <laughs> no, the, uh, Black Ice takes place in two time frames. The, the one is obviously during the winter, and the other one is during spring and summer. So, uh, but um, the Hammerby series, in fact, I worked hard to get it that each book takes place in a different month. It's just eight of them, not 12, but I covered uh, eight different months. So that was one of my thoughts when I wrote it. I try not to be too conscious about that um, because it, I, it, it tends to become a bit stereotypical that, that books set in the, the northern parts of the world, they are so dark, it, ra it, it rains all the time uh, and, and it's very foggy and yeah, I've, um, that is not necessarily the case, depends on where you live. Um, Oslo, where I live, is, I mean, it's, uh, we do have all the four seasons, obviously, but uh, uh, it's it's um, um, if you live up in the north of Norway, I think it's a very important thing to to um, to spend quite a bit of time um, talking about the weather because it affects people. I mean, they live without daylight for months at a time, and of course that affects people. Um, 
so but but I'm I'm not doing that I'm I'm writing my books from Oslo so I uh, I I don't want to uh, fall into that that stereotypical thing of of just putting rain on on every page I, I uh, <laughs> Um, it mustn't take over, but it's nice though to put some color to the book. You color, need to color know is fine, but what weather let's, it let's is. Let's bring some sun into yeah, it. Exactly. Why, why not? <laughs> There's enough darkness in in, uh, in the crime fiction novels. People die and get murdered, and let's have some sun. <laughs> yeah, I actually I use sunsets a lot in Lost Village because I like um, I like using the, the the idea of this this red overwhelming light signaling decay. <laughs> so I did use sunlight, but maybe not in the happy-go-lucky way that one might want. <laughs> and then in the resting place, ooh, I'm calling myself out here. Yeah, I used a giant snowstorm to get around the biggest problem of writing crime fiction in the 21st century, which is that everyone's got a goddamn cell phone, which means that when I want to have a murder or chase someone, I have to come up with a reason for why they do, don't just call the cops. So that snowstorm was a lifesaver, because then I could just go, yeah, snowstorm blew down all the cell phone towers. Terrible shame that. Anyway, let's get to the birder hunt over the frozen lake in the whirling snow. It was great. That's I a good weather. point, I think, because it was much easier to write crime, I think, uh, years ago before cell phones and, and stuff. Oh, yeah. Because now you, you have to consider those. This, uh, electronics all the time. Oh my you God, can't just yeah. go around them <laughs> because somebody knows where you are because they have yeah. find your iPhone or something on yeah. among their apps. Yeah. So, so that's really... So snowstorm has been used. Okay, I'm going to do earth <laughs> earthquake maybe. Earth phenomenal, yeah. Yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Now, now that we've been to California, we're all going to write about earthquakes. You don't have earthquakes in Norway, yeah. do you? Um, we do, but oh. very, very shallow ones. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah, we don't. I, in the elevator at the hotel, I noticed that there was an earthquake yeah. mode button, and I was fascinated <laughs> by it. I've no, never no, seen anything like I've that. I took a picture either. and sent it to my boyfriend, and I was like, "Look, earthquakes!" He worked in San Francisco for ten years, so he was like, "Yes, Camilla, I know earthquakes. They <laughs> happen there." I thought it was a myth. <laughs> it's not, now it's we weird. have tornadoes about this big. Yeah, they're they're very tiny and cute they're tornadoes. Very tiny yeah. tornadoes. <laughs> yeah. Again, uh, my boyfriend, who's from Austin, says they're pathetic, but I am very proud of our tornadoes. You're they are real yeah. tornadoes, and they count. That's going to make it hard to work that into a plot point if they're only that tall. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I have more questions, but I want to let the audience um, give, have a chance to ask you a few questions. We've got about 10 minutes left, and so um, do we have a mic? Is that how we're going to do this? Okay, so people are going to raise their hands, and someone's going to bring a mic. So this lady here on the left-hand side. Um, Scandinavian crime fiction I followed for years, and what each of you describe is not tr the traditional Scandinavian crime fiction that I'm used to. Is that purposeful? What, what are you used to? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm used to um, a uh, detective that doesn't get along with his children, <laughs> drinks too much, um, and always solves the crimes, but he's really a troubled soul. Yeah, but that was the traditional way of doing it. I, I think we are, we are modern thinkers. We want to do it differently, just to. But I think, yeah. Develop I, the genre. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. But I think I tick quite a few of those boxes, actually. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I mean. I, actually, I, I have a mother who writes crime fiction, so I think I'm naturally inclined to stay away from very traditional crime tropes, because uh, you really don't want to be compared to your mother. So my next book is actually about a, a sober lesbian who goes to therapy and solves crime while she's very happy with her wife. Uh, <laughs> it's a version. It's a version. Um, in the gray? Okay. Okay, well, I was just thinking about like um, who are some of your uh, authors who you admire, and is there a girl from, like, is there a Scandinavian tour, crime tour? You know, like the girl from the Brook Gragging Tattoo. Do you guys have anything like of your, I don't know, do you collaborate on it since you're like all focused on Oslo and Stockholm? You know, thank you. So, who are your favorite authors or influences? Well, um, when I started uh, started to 
really examine the crime fiction genre, trying to figure out what are the great ones doing in order to Im implement the techniques into my own writing. I, I looked to Sweden first um, because they, yeah, <laughs> yeah I know, I know. Um, because um, they were the ones who, who, who kind of, uh, um, they set the bar for, for us in, in Scandinavia with, uh, and, 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 and it started back in the 60s and the 70s with, uh, with um, Sjöval and what? what yes, mm -hmm. yes, because they were writing these socially um, very conscious books about, um, 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 it was a total of 10 books, I think, mm -hmm. wasn't it? And, and that kind of became the benchmark for, for other authors who came after them. Henning Monkel was probably be probably my first biggest influence. Um, I remember picking up a book of his when I was flying out to Mexico, and I, and at the end I didn't want the plane to land because I was reading, <laughs> and, and and I thought, my God, this guy is so good. I want to really try to figure out what is what is it that he's doing um, that makes me have this experience as a reader. So it it kind of started with him, and then and then he went on to others. Um, in, in it, well, still in, in Sweden. And then I kind of uh, looked into my own country with Jo Nespe, as I'm sure everyone knows, a couple of others as well. Um, and after a while, my, my, my focus shifted out to the rest of the world. Um, my, the last 10, 15 years, I've, I've been reading almost everything by Harlan Coburn, for instance, uh, Michael Connolly, uh, John Hart is probably my my favorite author at the moment. I think he, he writes just wonderful books. Um, so yeah, um, that is um, those people, those guys have, have been my main 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 influences. Um, well, I was inspired by, Dan by Danish television series. There was one called uh, um, the Mobile Unit. Um, it was the first Danish television series to win an Emmy. Award so, and I thought it was so good, and I was thinking, why doesn't any author write uh, stories like this, mm -hmm. where every book is like an episode in a TV series, as you just mentioned? And I thought, well, that is so sad because I love this series. And then I thought, well, maybe I will be the one to write that se yeah. a series like that. So I did. So that's what I did. I was really inspired by the the mobile unit. That was my my. Um, finest inspiration, I'd say. Uh, Stephen King, Daphne du Maurier, and if I don't say my mom, I'm gonna get it, so my mom, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for being here and sharing your stories. Um, you know, as you know, Nordic Noir has become super popular here and probably all over the world in TV and film. So which one of your books would you like to see adapted for TV or film? And All what, of them. All of them. <laughs> and and uh, what role would you as a writer want to play in the adaptation? Oh, that's a phenomenal question. <laughs> um, actually, the, the Lost Village is being developed for film right now. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Um, we're hoping for a decision very soon. Uh, I would want to play no roles because I am very awkward in front of a camera. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, th I think I would, I would get really nervous and sweaty and they'd have to kick me off the set eventually. But I would love one of those cool director's chairs so that you can just sit and boss people around and eat craft services, so that's yeah. my answer. That would be cool. No, I, I think it's every, every author's dream to have their stuff adapted for, you, for either TV or, or the big screen, for sure. That, is, that has certainly been mine since my first first novel was published back in 2010. Hasn't happened yet, but I'm I remain hopeful. Um, and if it if, if if it ever happens, I would like to be the the guy walking past on the on on the pavement or something when when something fun is happening. Just be in the background. That would be cool. I, I would be happy about that. Um, yeah. Well, of course. Uh, as an author, I want everything to be adapted for movies or even better television series. And it has almost happened several times, but they, I, I got paid for it, but they just take it back and they just don't do anything about it. But 
Um, well, it would be really nice. Maybe a film director is in the audience right now. Then here we are. <laughs> Options are available. Get your checkbooks out. Yeah, yeah. get us up. Yeah. So time for one more question, and we go right here in the front. Uh, just sort of the obvious question, as the woman was saying, uh, uh, n uh, Nordic noir is very popular. What is Nordic noir? Uh, we do don't you, know. How, how we do, have I no mean, clue. I mean, it's, how do you define yourselves, and are you self-conscious of being part of this tradition that you are actually diverging from in many ways? What, what is, how, would, how do you see yourself as a peculiarly Nordic in your writing? It's noir, really, only if it's noir. There's a lot of uh, Nordic crime that isn't noir, meaning black and dark and sad and so on. There are a lot of stories like, you know, the midsummer murder, stuff like that, more Id idyllic settings and so on. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, is, what, is, what, what is Nordic Noir? Well, I think it might be what the lady behind you mentioned earlier. It's the drunken detective and, you know, the sadness in his heart. But it's also, I'm writing really Noir, I think, because I write about uh, sad circumstances, sad people, sad things happen. I, you don't laugh much when you read my books, right? So I'm noir, for real, even though I don't have that drunken detective. I heard someone describe Nordic noir last year uh, at a virtual book fair as uh, the dame had legs up to her shoulders, but since it was December in Stockholm, you couldn't see them. <laughs> <laughs> That's about as good of a definition as I can give. <laughs> it's feel bad as opposed to feel good. That's it. <laughs> feel bad. Uh, yeah, indeed. Well, I, I, I certainly don't, I'm not very conscious of the fact that I'm part of that, that tradition. I write my books, I write my stories, and, and, and uh, I happen to live in the northern area, the northern area of the world, so I kind of just fit underneath that, that umbrella, naturally. Um, um, yeah, but, but, but at the same time, I'm, uh, I just want to write, write good books, good stories. I don't, I don't pay too much attention where, where I'm coming from in that sense. Um, um, yeah.